Good, Good morning. morning. It, it is time, time to begin our worship services here at Walker, Walker Hill, Hill, and, and we, we are delighted to have all of you with us, especially those of you that are visiting with us. We are uh, honored that you have chosen to worship with us today. And, uh, we, we, we have, have some, some of our college students at home, home and uh, it's, it's good, good to see all of you back, back with us uh, as well. well. And as as in the last uh, couple, couple of weeks, weeks this, this morning, morning we have a, a, uh, another special, special prayer request. Uh, our brother, brother Lupe Rodriguez, Rodriguez uh, is in the hospital. Uh, at first, first been diagnosed, diagnosed with uh, pneumonia. And uh, uh, Brother Lupe is not, not doing well. well. Uh, they, they have done a spinal tap, tap and they, they have, have discovered that he has uh, a form of meningitis uh, as, as well. well. And, and so, so uh, Brother Lupe has, has several things going, going on with him right now medically. And, and so, so his family is quite concerned, concerned and they've asked ask, uh, if we would pray for him this morning. morning. So if you'll bow with me. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, we are so grateful for you for our beautiful Lord's Day that, that we can come, come together, together, that, that we, we can worship you. Father, again, we are thankful for the avenue of prayer that, that we have, that, that we can come, come for you, you that, that we can bring our cares and our concerns before you. Father, this morning we lift up our brother, Lupe Rodriguez, and we pray your blessings to be with him and those doctors that have cared for him that you will guide their hands, that you will help them to use uh, their expertise to uh, find them the um, medicines that he needs that will help him to uh, start to improve. And we just pray that you will uh, guide them and pray that you will be with his family and that you will help them to continue to uh, be encouraged and help them to be comforted and help them to find peace. Father, we thank you for uh, all that you do uh, for us, we know uh, many times you can do more than any doctor can do. Father, we pray that you will just bless him, that you will give him the healing that he needs. Father, this morning we're also mindful of the tragedy of the storms of this past Friday evening, and we ask your blessings to be with all the families that have been uh, affected by the storms, those especially that have lost loved ones. We ask that you would be with them, that you would seek, help them to seek you, find comfort that they need, be with, uh, be with all the communities that will uh, have a, a long period of time to rebuild, and we just pray that you would bless the efforts that are being made to, to help those in need this time. Father, we are grateful that we can enter our worship service to you this morning, and that we are so blessed by all the good things you give us, especially by your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. In just a few moments, our first three songs will be projected on the screen behind me. They'll be number 200, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, and number 528, Praise God, and then all blessings flow. Before we sing these two songs, would you stand with me as I read from God's Word and remain standing for these songs? From 1 Chronicles 16, beginning in verse 23. Sing to the Lord out all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared of all the gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and gladness are in his place. Let's worship.
Next song, song this morning will be number 434, More Holiness Give Me. Give me. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, so many many times times we come come before you you asking for for what we feel feel we need. This This morning, dear God, God, let us come come before you letting know all the things that we are thankful to you for. We're thankful, dear God, God, that you have sent your Son to die for the sins of others. 
we can't begin to imagine what that must have been like, what the anguish that, that he suffered. We're thankful, dear God, for your church here at Walter Hill. We're thankful for the elders that you have provided to oversee your congregation here. We're thankful for the deacons and the roles that they perform. We're thankful for Paul and Chris and the many speakers that you've blessed this congregation with and the lessons that they presented to us. We're thankful, dear God, for the families that you've blessed us with, the families that help us grow closer to you. We're thankful, dear God, for this country that you have given us, the freedoms that you've provided. We're thankful for the leadership that we have. We're thankful that you have given us the opportunity to select who leads us in our country. We're thankful for those in the community that keep us safe, our military, our police, our fire departments, our first responders. We're thankful that you have created a certain attitude in these people. We're thankful, dear God, that we have this avenue of prayer to come before you, expressing our thanks for all many things that you have given us in our lives. We pray, dear God, that we continue to be thankful for all that you provide and remember that it is from you that all of our blessings flow. We pray this in your words and Son's holy name. Amen. Come from 2 Chronicles 7, 12 22. And the people are like the found page 7 or 391. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shall not have there is no rain or come in the locusts to devour the land, or some pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I'll forgive your sin and heal the land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears will attend to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen to sanctify this house, that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father did have walked, and did according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom, as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as his rule in Israel. But if you turn, turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, that everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and this house? Then they will answer, her, because they forsook the Lord God of the fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore he has brought all this calamity on them. Before our offering, we'll sing the first verse, number 638, the Lord has been mindful of me.
let, let us pray, pray for our offering, offering and remember how richly God has blessed us. Dear, Dear Lord, we come, come before you as your congregation and we uh, worship, worship and praise you. you. We thank, thank you for the endless gifts, gifts that, that you pour out upon our lives, Lord. Lord. Uh, we, we know, know that, that our blessings are countless and that, that uh, the, the more we seek to count them, the more we find. Lord, you, you are our God, God our Creator. Uh, you have uh, made us your children. children. You have saved us from our sins. sins. And you have um, prepared for us a home in heaven. And in this life, you've given, given us our homes and our families, uh, a country to live in that um, is a good country full of blessings. And you've you given us wealth. wealth. You've you given us uh, hope. And you've given us so much, Lord. Lord. And we, we thank, thank you for those blessings, Lord. Lord. Help, Help us to, to respond to those blessings with the generosity, uh, recognizing that, that all these blessings are not only a gift from you, but also that, that all that we own is truly yours, and that, that we are only stewards of it, taking care of it to the best of our ability to love and serve you with what we have. Lord, help us to keep that in mind and to remember that. And help us as we uh, give back to you today and give of what you've given, given us, uh, this portion, Lord, please bless it and help it to, to uh, fulfill your work here in this church. Uh, help this church to be able to uh, spread its mission and to be able to reach more and more souls throughout our community and throughout the world. Lord, we thank you for blessing and being able to give. We thank you that um, in giving to us, you've taught us how to give and how to be generous. And the great joy that comes from giving. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. It's in the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing the first three verses in number 742. I survey the worship cross. And following communion, we will sing the fifth verse.
Is there anyone who has not been able to get a cup? Okay. okay. Uh, let, let us pray, pray before, before the bread. bread. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, we thank, thank you and we praise you. you. You are our creator and our God. God. You made us and brought us into this world. You filled the world with light and with love and with beauty. But when we follow darkness and we turn to sin, and yet, yet your love is so great that you sent your son to die for us. Without him, we would be broken, we would be destroyed. But through your son, we have a sacrifice and a hope. Lord, help us to embrace this sacrifice with our whole hearts and to turn our hearts to you and to, and to love, love you wholly and fully as you've you shown, shown us and taught us what love means. Lord, help, help us now, now as we remember the broken body of your Son on the cross and help, help us as we take this bread, this symbol of his body, that, that we do so with open hearts, with hearts turned to you in thankfulness, in gratefulness, in love. And that in taking this bread together as a congregation, we share in that fellowship and in that sacrifice. And so we celebrate the redemption that you offer to us. It's in the name of your Son, we pray.
Like tomorrow, our invitation song at the end of the lesson will be number 701. So tomorrow may be too late. This is the first and third verses at that time. Now, now before, before the lesson, we'll sing, sing number 12, the last, and did my Savior leave. We'll sing all five verses followed by the chorus. If it's it's convenient for you, would you please stand? Sex. 
attempts to, to remove all gender distinctions in sports and restrooms, and bowing to the demands of the perverted alphabet soup mob, spitting, if you will, in God's holy face. And these actions have prompted many Christians to point to the verse in our reading this morning, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. As a nation and as individuals, we need healing. Last week, as we were concluding our lesson, a lesson on the second advent we read from 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12. And from these verses, we are reminded that you and I as Christians should be looking for Christ's return. But, but that we should also be hastening that return. And to do the latter, to make Christ's return sooner. One suggestion from a Jewish perspective was by repentance and godly living. Although repentance is not mentioned in our scripture reading, it is defined in verse 14. Israel was certainly forewarned, and I believe we are too, forewarned about repentance in this text. It is never too late to turn back to God. And that's what I want us to study together for the next few minutes. As always, at Walker Hill, we urge you to be like the Brins and at 1711. Search your Bibles every day to make sure that what we're preaching is the truth of God's holy word. Looking back at 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, I think we can identify four ingredients of repentance. If my people who are called by my name will, number one, humble themselves, and number two, two pray. And number, number three, seek my face. And number, number four, turn from their, their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And, and, and to just sum it up, repentance involves humility, prayer, seeking God's face, and turning from wicked ways. And as we turn to the New Testament, I believe that we'll find the same ingredients in repentance still are necessary for God's forgiveness. You may recall that both John the Baptist and Jesus came preaching a uh, message of repentance because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew 3, verse 2, and Matthew 4, verse 17, respectively. And then shortly before our risen Savior ascended back to heaven, he gave this commission to his apostles in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter gave this command to the penitent Jews who realized they had crucified the Messiah, and the Jews were there in Jerusalem, Acts 2, 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Before we look at any more scriptures, 
I want us to notice some definitions, some definitions from, from a couple of reflexicons uh, about this word repentance. In this particular dictionary that's used by uh, translators of the Greek text into various language, Barclay Newman defines the verb for repent and the noun for repentance as a change of heart, turning from one's sins, and a change of ways. Now, now notice the, the definition and comments by Lola and Ida and other experts in, in, in the, the Greek, Greek language, and they, they define both the verb and the noun. To change one's way of life as the result of a complete, complete change of thought and attitude with regards to sin and righteousness, to repent, to change one's ways, repentance. And then they complete their definitions with these thoughts, and, and this is what I think is very uh, important. Though in English a focal component of repent is the sorrow or contrition that a person experiences because of sin, the emphasis in these Greek words seems to be, more specifically, the total change, the total change both in thought and behavior with respect to how one should both think and act. I think they hit the nail on the head for what repentance is. Thought and action. Whether the focus is upon attitude or behavior varies somewhat in different contexts. When, when, when we consider repentance, we understand it involves both a change in thought and behavior. You may recall John the Baptist uh, in a very strong confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, who had come out uh, to where he was baptizing to witness that. And uh, I don't know, maybe some of them came thinking they might be baptized. Matthew 3, verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. But then the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, when he was uh, making his defense before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, and during that defense, he recounts his conversion story for the third time that's recorded in the book of Acts. And to, and to King Agrippa, he re reiterated how the Lord had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And the Lord told Saul that uh, at that time he was known as Saul. He would send him to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. Now, that, that would definitely entail a total change in thinking and behavior as well as seeking the face of God. And based on the Lord's commands to, to Saul on that road to Damascus, listen to how he recounts his actions in verses 19 and 20. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Repentance brings about a complete change of behavior or action. It's, it's evidenced by the, the works, works that, that bear witness to our changes in thought. Now, now repentance, unlike baptism, is not a one-time event in conversion. It has to be a continued activity since we all continue to sin. We all continue to need forgiveness. You remember Simon the sorcerer from Acts chapter 8 who was baptized in response to the preaching of Philip? And because he had been a magician, when he saw the 
the power in the apostles' hands is they could lay their hands on people and they would receive this miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. He offered Peter and John money to purchase this power for himself to do the same. And here's Peter's response. But Peter said to him, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by an iniquity. Here a Christian needed to repent. And it involved prayer as well as a change in thinking. So many times, again, we, we consider repentance as something that's required before baptism and conversion. And we, we, we take, take that from Acts 2.38 and other passages. However, 2 Peter 3.9, which we read last week and we've already read this morning, was written to those who had obtained like precious faith with the Apostle Peter by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffered toward us, not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should, should come, come to repentance. Church, maybe, maybe this is the message that all of us need this morning. Our need for repentance, whether it's public or private. As I've been watching Christmas movies over the past two weeks, there's one character that stands out as a, a good example of repentance. Ebenezer Scrooge. I mean, what a miserable, miserly misfit was this man. And a glimpse into the future caused him to change his thinking. It caused him to change his ways, and he did a complete U-turn. And, and not only did he turn his life around, he did things which showed that he had truly changed. And it makes me ask myself, what will it take to cause us to repent? And perhaps we need to reread this verse, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For God's sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Again, these words were written to Christians. And you and I need to understand the meaning of God's sorrow in this passage. And perhaps if we, we grasp the meaning of this phrase, it will produce repentance in us. The translators of the New American Standard Bible try to supply the meaning of godly sorrow in their translation. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God, and other sets in italics, they added that, to help us maybe understand the meaning of this verse. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The will of God. What God desires of you and me, that's the will of God. What He desires for us as people. It's revealed in this little book. It's revealed in God's holy word. And maybe, maybe we just aren't familiar enough with what the good book says. 
Maybe we need to heed the Apostle Paul's advice found in Ephesians 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When we fail to submit to the will of God, and that demands humility, when we fail to submit to the will of God, we should grieve. We should sorrow that we have failed to obey God's will. This godly sorrow, realizing that we have let God down, should lead us to repentance. And that's not just feeling sorry for what we've done. Or maybe feeling sorry for what we failed to do. Godly, godly sorrow leads us to do something about it. To change course. Or to do you turn. Let me give you an example about making you turn in Scripture. If you will turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verses 41 through 45. It's just a familiar story. It should be a familiar story to everyone. His parents talking about Joseph and Mary, the parents of Jesus. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his Mary did not, and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Well, you and I know the ending of the story. It has a happy ending because Joseph and Mary found Jesus in the temple three days later. He was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. But let's go back while they were on the road. And can you imagine their heartache and their anxiety when they found their son, God's only son, missing? They had traveled a day's journey from Jerusalem when they discovered that loss. Now they would have been very foolish to continue on their journey and go on home, wouldn't they? Very foolish. It would have been very foolish to continue in the same direction without Jesus. Instead, they Maybe you turn, turn, they return, return to Jerusalem to find their son. Unless God runs out of patience, or we die, or Christ comes again, we can change directions. We can make, make you turn. turn. We, we can, can repent. repent. Like, like Mary and Joseph, Joseph the, the, the question, question is, are we going home today without, without Jesus? Do we, we need to, to change the direction of our lives? Do we need to change directions in order to obey God's will this morning? The invitation is very simple this morning. God continues to call us to repentance. If you need to respond anyway, won't you come? All together we stand and sing.